All right. Uh, nice. Filling up nicely. Uh, thanks for joining us here. And of course, if you're online watching this later too. Um, I'm going to give us some motivation uh, for Project ARIA. Hopefully, uh, most of you are in the room for the tutorial because you do know something about Project ARIA. This is our second uh, CVPR tutorial and workshop combo. And um, it's always good to sort of get back to the roots of what it is about, what we're trying to achieve, and why we need you uh, and the community working on this with us. Uh, OK, so it's the wrong direction. Good start. OK. So here's a, here's a quote. Um, I'm eager to find out who knows where this quote is. Let me speak to you. If you were supplied with a computer that worked all day long and was instantly responsive to every action that you had, how much value could you derive from that? Now, my assumption is very few people know where this quote is from. But let's check. Any, anybody? Not, not cheating if you put your hand up if you're from the uh, Meta Labs. OK, so these communities, this is what I, I really want to speak to you about, basically are separate today. This is a quote from the very famous Doug Engelbart, who basically introduced the modern computing paradigm in around 1968 with a demo, what's called the mother of all demos. Now, you may have heard of that. And the mother of all demos is basically the very first time that things like a graphical user interface, together with a mouse-powered, uh, basically, Windows-like uh, PC experience with a spreadsheet and networked PCs, uh, was actually shown in the world. Pieces had been developed in different labs, but no one had put them all together into a, a complete experience of a future uh, computing uh, you know, lab built for humans to go and do their work, not on paper, but completely digitally. Now, from there, uh, essentially, the explosion from what was the original Auto that they were using and building on top of that demo from 68 into about 73 led to the PCs, ultimately to Mac, when Steve Jobs went and visited Auto and, and saw basically the research, saw that that was the future for uh, basically how humans are going to interact with computers. And then, essentially, over our generation of sort of like, you know, from the 90s and the last sort of like decade and a bit, uh, in the t early 2000s, um, the mobile phone came along. Now, there's not a single person in this room who doesn't have a mobile phone in their pocket, and that is the true sort of like child of all of that. It is a graphical user interface in 2D, driven by essentially a pointer you know, with a finger instead of a mouse. It's connected to the internet. It, en it enables billions and trillions of dollars to flow. The most powerful and, and, and influential companies on the planet are basically in the business of building those devices and giving them to billions of people. OK, so what's that got to do with ARIA? Well, let's get into it. We're now here with virtual and mixed reality devices. If you didn't see it, Apple has, uh, you know, saying that they're releasing the Apple Vision Pro, which is a mixed reality device. And of course, Meta has been developing products uh, in that space now for, you know, a good eight years, including multiple releases of uh, essentially te untethered uh, headsets, and a lot of progress is being made in this space of VR and mixed reality. These are wearable computers, and they push beyond the capabilities of those 2D rectangles that you keep in terms of the user interface by embodying you within the experience so that your body becomes part of the control, and also your perception system can start to be liberated from the 2D windowing systems to a full 3D experience. Now, the way that we like to think about this is that it really is providing a new class of wearable rendering surface. And they take the form of these three visual, auditory, and haptic modalities that otherwise are completely, uh, essentially, you know, limited in a 2D uh, windowing system. And of course, to enable a visual rendering system that, say, for example, 3D, needs a lot of technologies that the computer vision communities have been building for you know, the last 30 odd years. Auditory uh, experiences, including spatialized audio, become possible with these wearable devices, not possible with laptops and mobile phones. And actually, there's a future of haptic interaction, where effectively you can interact with virtual objects and real objects alike, and blend or mix reality together. But something's missing from this experience. So whilst it clearly is an advancement beyond the mobile phones that you have, uh, it's not everything. Let's return to the quote from Doug Engelbart. So a computer that works all day long and is instantly responsive to every action. Let's think about this. Now, remember, he was saying that quote whilst demonstrating the precursor of computers and mobile phones. 
What would it mean to have a computer that actually works all day long? Well, I put it to you, number one, it would have to go everywhere you go, because if you have to be tied to a desk or to something where you can't carry it with you everywhere into the coffee shop, even you know, out in the public spaces, in your cars, on a plane, etc., if you can't do all those things, it obviously can't work all day long with you unless you limit your experience of reality, for example, to a, a desktop PC. And what does it mean to be instantly responsive to every action that you had? I put it to you again that whilst there are some things that are essentially immediate mode interactions where you want a computer to give you an answer based on a very short amount of input, actually most of the things that you care about throughout your entire day, week, month, year, decades of living actually are contextualized not by a single moment's information but by exactly minutes, hours, weeks, years, decades of understanding you. And of course, that's why you have friends and relatives that you love and want to spend time with, and your colleagues eventually get to know you, and they work more effectively with you, and vice versa, because of that long context window. So whereas PCs and mobile phones work instantly and responsively to a very simple interaction, a simple context, you know, where your finger is on the screen, or where your mouse cursor is, or what your keyboard immediately says, it cannot possibly be instantly responsive to an action that requires context that may be months in the making. What does it mean to have a computer help you with your health condition if all it can get is basically a very simple, hey, Siri, I want you to help me with my health condition, and it has nothing else about you? That's not going to be possible. OK, so I'm going to claim that essentially whilst mixed reality for wearable immersive experiences is very much here, and we see that from two big companies making products, uh, essentially that's not the be-all and end-all of computing. What else? Well, now AI is here. So whereas in CVPR last year, if you were here, and many people may have heard of GPT, not everyone would have experienced it. Now I doubt there's a single person in this room who hasn't had a chat GPT experience. In fact, you know, who has used chat GPT? Amazing. That is 100% of the audience. OK, so that's one year's worth of development in AI. Uh, but interesting. AI is here, but there's a gap there as well, right? Who can think what that gap is? Well, if you've had that experience with ChatGPT, you will know that it can answer those kind of immediate questions or things where there's world knowledge that's come from the internet. But it can't know about you unless you literally type it in. Hey, you know, I'm Richard, I'm a 40-year-old, I like cycling a lot, you know, I just crashed my bike and I'd like to... And you keep going and you just have to put it all in there by typing it. It's missing context. And it's that that we call contextualized AI that we think actually is the thing that really needs to happen, that can only happen if you have two things, and that is context of you, and that comes from these components, basically all day wearable devices, and also the ability to essentially have machine perception, take the data from those devices and turn them into signals that then things like AI can actually work with. AI cannot consume an entire day's worth of egocentric uh, imagery. It's just too big. We'll see how big some of that is uh, in the various different talks later on today. But when you do put those two together, you get contextualized AI, and it's a, a very new class of problem to solve for. You have to solve the problems with wearable devices, machine perception, and you have to put it together with AI. These fields are not separate. They're going to be combined. Okay. So this is the always-on AI challenge. And the kind of essentially nugget or, or, or view of the problem that we're trying to solve with ARIA that I want to give is to, is to first of all plant you back in reality. In reality, you wake up and if you're a glasses wearer like me, you sort of like fumble for your glasses to put them on because otherwise you're not really going very far. And from that point on, your day kind of unravels uh, in you know, good or different ways for everyone, in subtly varied ways. And the question is, what would a machine perception system through an entire day have to capture to be useful for you? That is a question, and you can answer it. And realistically, what we're trying to do with Project ARIA is to find the machine perception algorithms that get that context throughout your entire day, multiplied by through weeks, months, ultimately years, and bring it to bear with AI to enable contextualized AI. So always on AI, context and machine perception, always on. That's the other differentiator. There's lots of AI. There's lots of what you can think of as very short-term contextualized AI, a video clip, multimodal, that lasts perhaps 20 seconds. That's not the same as machine perception and AI working together that is never off. It has to be on, otherwise it's going to miss those subtle details that matter to you. So what I claim is essentially that if we're going to enable useful, lifelong, always-on AI, you're going to have to solve these problems. You're going to have to solve that context gap, get the context of a human, get it 
into the AI's memory. You're going to have to solve the wearable machine perception problem to get that context, because otherwise you're not going to be able to get the data from the user's life. And you're going to have to solve these new low power, small form factor constrained machine perception challenges to enable that wearable device to become real. Because we can't walk around in those big mixed reality headsets. It's uh, basically painful after a, after a few hours. Um, the battery runs out. And that leads to this new class of machine perception, which I think we're just all starting to be aware of. And perhaps you know this is one of the first times that you may have heard about it. It's distributed machine perception. So when we look at the really hard problems of solving for those constrained form factors, ultra low power, always on, what we find is challenges that we don't think you can solve in a single device. But you may be able to solve if you have a federation of devices working together to solve those machine perception problems. So I'm just going to leave those with you as basically the new grand challenges in computer vision. And this, this first one, this wearable machine perception, is exactly where ARIA kicks off. So going from something like a Quest Pro into a glasses form factor is non-trivial. We're going to hear about the various different challenges today. These are the three problems I want to leave you with uh, before I hand back to the team to take you through some of the amazing and you know, opportunities that are presented with ARIA devices and, and services. These are what I think researchers should be working on basically for the next decade to solve this context gap and enable contextualized AI. First of all, we've got to get to grip with the fact that the data coming from these always-on devices are so massive that the current paradigm of machine learning, which is about end-to-end -end learning, cannot work. You cannot capture a person's year with egocentric data from a device like ARIA and hope to train a transformer end-to-end. -end. That data set is somewhere on the order of one to 10 petabytes just for one sample. So you're going to have to solve the compression problem. Now, that might be tokenization. That might be things like Perceiver I.O. that try and compress into a latent space. It might be very special, very tuned algorithms for machine perception, like SLAM and object detection, et cetera. But that is the challenge, compressing reality and basically going from petabytes of egocentric data down into something that actually can be consumed by current and future generations of machine learning. Even if you can do it in principle, so take these data sets, run them on giant GPUs, show you can compress reality, you then need to do that on these form factors that basically are on the order of milliwatts of power. To give you an idea of the sort of power we're talking about, this is a Project ARIA device. There's an LED in the corner. It's a bit smaller than this blue one here. That LED takes around 5 milliwatts of power. We believe that the entire device will have available to you 100 milliwatts of power for the entire day. And the LED is already taking 5 milliwatts. A normal mobile phone camera takes over 100 milliwatts simply to take a 60 frame per second video. And imagine the kind of data that comes off a Project ARIA device today. It takes a lot more than 100 milliwatts. So you're going to have to solve all those algorithms on tiny amounts of power. And that necessitates an entirely new class of thinking about algorithms through a very different view of sparseness of information that today we're not used to. We're used to putting the data sets through big machine learning algorithms. Then maybe cranking the handle of quantization and sparsification after the fact. But you're not going to be able to do that when you've got to be constrained with ten, tens of milliwatts of power. You need new classes of algorithms. And this is when we get back to, well, you know, maybe one single device doesn't need to solve everything all the time. And that's distributed machine perception. Very excited to talk about that with everybody here. And there was a great workshop at ICCV exactly on this topic uh, just two weeks ago. OK, so I'll leave you with this thought. If you are in an area uh, doing your PhD or a postdoc or in general researching, I really think this is the area where the next breakthroughs are going to come, basically, in combining machine perception on ultra-low power, always on form factors like glasses. Because if we can solve that, then we can unlock contextualized AI. And it's contextualized AI that really will enable what we call the second great wave of human-oriented computing that will elevate us past these kind of 2D rectangles that have no context into devices that are useful for you everywhere you go, all the time, you know, for everyone doing pretty much everything they want to do. With that, I'm going to hand back to Prince. Thank you, everyone.